I was at my computer when she came in late again about 10 p.m. Dinner and homework were done and the kids were asleep, barely sensing her absence anymore, which hurt me. I'd been examining our weak finances worsened over two years while she continued to spend unwisely. After addressing the newest expenses, I discovered we might manage for a few more months, forcing me to reassess my life decisions amid constant financial stress. I was so buried in contemplation that I didn't immediately see her standing there observing me. When I finally did, she broke the stillness, her arms crossed and sporting an expression of scorn. Michael, I think we should get a divorce. It wasn't very entertaining, yet I found myself stifling a chuckle. My wife, my companion of seventeen years, had just proclaimed our marriage over, preparing to ruin everything we had achieved together. It was a sensation I hadn't had in ages, and it nearly provided a sense of comfort. I stared at her briefly, taking a final mental journey down memory lane to our brighter moments. Then reality snapped back into focus. Okay. I excelled more in programming than in management responsibilities. However, experienced programmers routinely advanced to leadership positions, resulting to me becoming the senior manager of product development. Despite excelling in coding and knowing our flagship product inside out, I found myself in a managerial role, missing the excitement of programming. The higher money was enticing, but my tasks left little room for coding. Eventually, I was fired owing to intermittent attendance and missing deadlines. It took me months to come to terms with the circumstance and find a solution I could tolerate. If it weren't for the kids, I might have gone mad. Their steady regimen helped me reestablish a sense of normalcy. I completely embraced the position of being a stay-at-home parent, taking responsibility of domestic chores and chauffeuring obligations. If my wife observed this alteration in our family relations, she never brought it up. I'm very sure she didn't even notice. We got married shortly after college and moved into our first apartment in Chicago. Money was scarce, but we supported each other. Jennifer left her job after eight years when we had our son Jacob, and our daughter Emily was born just over a year later. Indeed, they were given the most popular names at the time. Following a family tradition, we purchased a three-bedroom house in the suburbs, replete with adequate space for a dog, and bought a family sedan and a minivan. Overall, our life was beautifully set up with two kids, a pet, a house, and two automobiles. Perfectly average. I thought I couldn't be any happier, but I was mistaken. I was promoted to manager just after Emily's first birthday. My new income was great, and it came with flexible working hours. I worked from home most days, only venturing into the office for meetings. When Emily began primary school, Jennifer chose to return to work part-time. She swiftly secured a job she enjoyed at a fledgling marketing firm, coming to work after dropping off the kids and completing when it was time to pick them up. It was a great arrangement. We didn't need her money, so we saved all of it. I calculated that by the time our kids finished college, we could retire comfortably. Three months before our 15th anniversary, I unintentionally found that Jennifer was having an affair. It happened exactly around my birthday— I actually happened into the proof two days before, but didn't recognize what it was until later. It took me a couple weeks to put everything together. I didn't think much of it when Jennifer decided to take on more responsibility at her job, which meant she worked extra hours and I had to pick up the kids. It didn't significantly impact my schedule, and I was pleased to help. After about three months, I observed she appeared distracted. When I approached her about it, she mentioned she was simply adjusting to her new role at work and felt a bit anxious. I opted to manage more at home to lessen her tension. Our bed life slowed down again. I was reluctant to bring it up again, fearing a fight. I was almost at my breaking point when I found the present. The temperature had fallen quite a bit, and I was looking for one of my sweatshirts. Since I had taken over doing the laundry, I often got muddled up about which clothes went in which cupboard. While browsing through sweaters in her wardrobe, I noticed something under some old shoe boxes. It was hard to overlook a pink box with a white ribbon from the lingerie store. The card titled Lover grabbed my curiosity. I debated for a second. Should I open it now or wait? I decided to open it. I doubted I could wait till my birthday to be with my wife after receiving the card. Please forgive the elaborate wrapping. Your genuine gift can be unwrapped on your birthday. When I'm wearing what's in the box, then you can have my last innocence. Love always, Jennifer. 
I had always been fascinated about trying a total proximity, as we hadn't gone past some light touching. Just thinking about it had me really eager for the following two days. I truly tried to make her feel special. I welcomed her with flowers and made her favorite supper, but her reply was lukewarm, like she was just putting up with my devotion on my birthday. I made sure the kids did their homework early so nothing would interrupt my evening. I was shocked when Jennifer got home late from work and even more bewildered when she asked what was for dinner. Still, I played along, expecting for my surprise. I suggested we go out for pizza, which made the kids delighted. At the restaurant, our son covertly arranged with our waiter to sing Happy Birthday to me. As we were leaving, I thought I noticed a spark of astonishment in Jennifer's eyes, but she immediately covered it up. I'll give you your present later, Michael, she responded with a smile. The drive home was stressful. I nearly had a car accident. The 15 minutes it took for the kids to get ready for bed were stressful, but the next 15 minutes waiting for them to really fall asleep were even worse. Luckily, Jennifer got back after a quick trip to the grocery for milk immediately after they were asleep. When I got to our bedroom, Jennifer wasn't there. I sat down on the bed. A little while later, she came out of the bathroom wearing a long flannel nightgown, no makeup, and her hair in a ponytail. At this time, I was getting unhappy with the delays. When would I get my present? She went into bed and pulled up the covers. She started to turn off her bedside lamp, but halted. Oops, I almost forgot. She unlocked her nightstand drawer, brought out a little package wrapped in the same multicolored balloon paper from Michael's last birthday, and handed it to me. Happy birthday, sweetheart. That was all. She turned over, turned off her lamp, and fell asleep. I was so startled that I didn't even open the present. My sadness really kicked in the next day. I continued repeating the day's events, trying to comprehend what had gone wrong and why our night ended so terribly. I felt absolutely confused and wallowed in my grief. For about two weeks, the unopened presents appeared to tease me, indicating my failure. I've heard all the traditional sayings the husband is always the last to know. I must admit I was absolutely ignorant. I couldn't even envision Jennifer being unfaithful. It seemed so implausible that I never even considered it might happen. However, the thought suddenly came to me when 13 days after my birthday, she called to say she'd be home late. It's Alan's 30th birthday, and the staff is taking him out to celebrate. I might be home fairly late. I don't recall how I answered or even how I got to the bedroom closet, but I distinctly remember seeing the empty area where my present used to be. I also recall the awful agony in my chest and then throwing up in the restroom for quite some time. I thought I was suffering a heart attack and briefly I wanted it would end my life. Alan Henderson, Jennifer's boss, was a young, sleek advertising executive who always seemed a touch sleazy. I had met him just once and didn't like him much because he appeared so false. It was Emily who snapped me out of it. Dad, are you okay? It took a bit before I could see my daughter properly as she stood there prepared to cry. I'm all right, sweetheart. I just ate something awful. I'll be out in a minute. I just need to clean up. I did manage to exit the bathroom eventually, though I don't recall much after that. I do remember picking up my dusty bottle of scotch. I didn't know when Jennifer came home. When I saw her in the kitchen the next morning, feeding the kids and acting normal, nothing seemed to miss. However, I detected a small wince when she sat down to eat, and that killed any leftover sympathy I had for her. It was a subtle sign, but it was there. It took until the weekend of our 15th anniversary for me to finally resolve to do something about it. I'd been too terrified to act, thinking maybe I was just in shock. If my dad were still living, he'd have openly told me I was being cowardly, and he'd have been correct. The insight only came when my wife indicated she had to travel away for a work conference during our anniversary. It struck me as yet another evidence of disrespect, especially given she seemed clueless to the significance of the anniversary. After drinking myself to sleep, I woke up outraged. I had reached my breaking point. I called my lawyer and booked an appointment. I was ready to terminate the farce. I was confident things couldn't get any worse. I was mistaken. The confident attitude I had stepping into my lawyer's office suddenly turned into absolute disbelief. I was aware divorces were tough. I assumed my wife's affair would be to my advantage. But my lawyer detected many problems in my reasoning. I didn't have any proof of her infidelity. Even if I did, it wouldn't mean much. 
she'd still be entitled to half of our assets. I also have no indication she was a horrible parent. So the best I could aspire for was joint custody. The fact that I made more money also helped my wife in terms of alimony and child support. She would undoubtedly receive primary custody and the ability to stay in our house for the kids' sake. Here I was feeling like a complete fool, deceived by a cheating wife. I went from being depressed to extremely upset. A few weeks later, my wife even commented on it. Michael, you definitely don't look well. Is something bothering you? No, dear. She seemed to express concern, at least superficially. As for me, I merely drifted through life. Then I lost my job. I didn't realize it then, but that was the best thing that could have happened to me. I came up with a basic notion for a plan. If there was nothing left, my wife couldn't take anything. We'd be left with nothing. So there would be nothing to split. Sure, I'd be hurting myself too, but I was already going to lose half. So did it really matter? My plan was straightforward. I was jobless and I chose not to look for jobs. I was going to squander up all our savings until there was nothing left. It was a wild concept, and even I doubted it would work. But it gave me something to cling on to. Two years can feel like eternity. It was terribly dull when I was by myself, which was most of the time. I understood Jennifer was the major connector in our network of friends. As she pulled away, I found myself without any close pals. I'm an only child, and both my parents passed very young. My dad had a heart attack and my mom from cancer. I was entirely alone. Detailing every minute of these years would be tedious for you. To put it simply, my life was horrible. The only positive aspect was my children. I had always been frugal and never spent money on useless stuff. I still kept receipts for everything I bought. I began withdrawing a modest amount of cash every week and setting it aside. After two months, I saw we weren't running through money quickly enough to affect anything. It turns out I was amazing at saving money, but not good at spending it. So I decided to step it up and adjust my plan. I signed up for an executive MBA program at a neighboring but pricey university, which cost me roughly $120,000. I bought a new luxury SUV for $60,000 and fully financed my kids' educational savings accounts with another $260,000. I spent thousands on new outfits and started taking out more cash twice a week. I would put the kids at school, head to the bank, and then go to the lakefront. I didn't really gamble much of the money. I withdrew. I merely spent a little here and there to keep myself entertained. I spent enough to indicate I'd been to the casino, including receipts for meals, snacks, and parking. Most of the money ended up in the wall, safe in our garage, my personal reserve, in case the divorce got unpleasant. My other huge expense. I hired a private investigator to watch my wife and her lover full-time. I got the complete bundle videos, images, a daily report of their activity, I'm embarrassed by how much I spent on that. You could question if my wife noticed how I was wasting our money. I would say she did, except for the gambling portion. I had to inform her about sending money to our kids' account since I wanted her signature. She observed my new car and clothes, but never commented on them. I'm pretty sure she imagined I was still working and that we were financially comfortable. She also made other purchases, but I never brought them up. I often wondered whom she was buying all the new underwear for. However... We never talked about it. We were nice to each other and interacted daily like roommates who didn't really like each other. As for proximity, that was off the table. Spending time with my children was the best part of my life. I supported their interests, assisted with their homework, played games with them, and we went to parks, rode bikes, and watched movies together, since I had taken over cooking. They started exhibiting interest in helping out in the kitchen, and I found some simple dishes for us to create together. Jennifer was around sometimes during the week. I didn't prohibit her from joining in on our family time, but I didn't go out of my way to include her either. She participated if she wanted to, without any encouragement or discouragement from me. I received weekly reports on my wife's activities. I initially thought she was just involved with her boss, but it turned out she was seeing numerous men from her office and subsequently several of the company's clients as well. Did it hurt? Not really. I already viewed her terribly, so seeing solid proof didn't impact me much. The reports and footage were like crudely directed sexual films. In some ways, knowing made me feel a bit better, but not by much. It was evident that Alan Henderson wasn't particularly adept at being intimate. 
although he had countless possibilities with other women. There was one client, an archetypal geek with spectacles and a pocket protector who was pretty rough with Jennifer. The photographs and video were too fuzzy to discern if she liked it, but it seemed terrible to me. Despite my schooling, time with the kids, and gaming, I had plenty of free time. So I started focused on what my life may be like after my marriage, which I figured would end soon. I began a new workout routine. I'd always been fairly fit, though. Nothing extraordinary. Over time, I did improve my strength and jogging endurance. I believe having huge muscles and nice looks is mostly inherited. And I didn't really fall into either category. Still, I was fairly happy with how I appeared. I started catching up on the newest advancements in my prior industry, expecting I'd need a job shortly. A year away had put me more behind than I thought. I spent a few hours daily studying about the latest technology and applications. I kept an eye on my old employer, CTS, which seemed to be languishing. They weren't losing market share and their revenue was consistent, but they weren't making any headway either in the tech world. If you're not moving forward, you're falling behind. I also spent a lot of time researching divorces. I did allow myself some time to think up fresh and spiteful methods to deal with my soon-to-be ex-wife. But largely, I focused on how divorce affects children. I had worked through most of my personal pain, and the kids had been a huge part of that recovery. I wanted to ensure I was totally prepared for their transition. There's a lot of material out there. Much of it seemed foolishness to me. Eight months into my strategy, I began to worry. My wife started arriving home at predictable times and engaged me in chat about my day. I responded shortly, but she persisted. She also began wearing more seductive nightwear, presumably wanting to reignite our previous spark. After a few weeks, things got even more strained. She had been distant for a year and a half, just going through the motions. But now she complained about our bad communication and talked about fixing our marriage. So I stopped talking to her totally. Her efforts to reconcile things continued until her birthday. I left her gift on the dining room table, wrapped in the same paper she had used for the last gift she gave me. The contents were presumably no surprise either. It took me six months to open the last birthday gift from her, a watch with a cheap digital display. I'd seen a comparable $9.95 watch at our neighborhood convenience store and was incensed by its cheapness. When I saw a similar model for ladies, I bought it, waiting 18 months to give it to her. I nearly wanted to witness her expression when she opened it, but I wasn't there. The kids and I had gone out for an unplanned movie night and arrived home late. She had left before we woke up the next day, then everything restored to the status quo. Jennifer began staying out late again. We seldom spoke at home. And then it finally happened. Michael, I want a divorce. I was hoping she would move swiftly, but it took over a week before I received her divorce paperwork. It was nearly funny. She claimed spousal and child support, an unequal split of our assets in her favor, and asserted mental and emotional harm. I waited until the following Monday to take the kids camping so they wouldn't be around when I answered strongly. We came back six days later feeling rested and revitalized. Jennifer was at home waiting for us, sitting alone in the living room, looking pretty poorly, probably with the stomach flu. I wondered what surprised her the most. I had filed a counterclaim for divorce, citing her adultery, asking for the house. The only significant thing we had left and full custody of the kids, as I had been the sole caretaker and was unemployed. I also requested spousal and child support. Additionally, I filed lawsuits for alienation of affection against Jennifer's seven partners. I didn't expect to win these, but Illinois law allowed it. So I pursued them hard. I also sued her job and three clients who were engaged with her, not expecting to win, but hoping the bad publicity may aid my case. Lastly, I delivered a DVD of Jennifer's excursions to her parents and best friend, ensuring she knew I was ready to use it. She should have known about the evidence for my counterclaim, but I took no chances. The kids grabbed some snacks and went to their rooms to get ready for bed, ignoring their mother who didn't bother to communicate with them. I got a drink from the fridge and sat down across from Jennifer in the living room. She didn't look at me for a long time and seemed to be crying, probably in agony. Eventually, she murmured, You'll ruin me. I waited for her to glance up so I could see her eyes when I replied. After a few seconds, I said, God, I hope so. I anticipated to feel more fulfilled in that moment when a single tear trickled down her cheek. I felt nothing. Do you dislike me that much? No, Jennifer. I don't hate you. Hate requires work. 
I can honestly say I made no effort towards you. All my effort is about taking care of myself and my children. But I am your wife. Stop. I won't let someone like you destroy my wife's good name. My wife was lovely, caring, my greatest friend and the mother of my children. She's gone. You're merely the one who took her place. Don't act like you're linked to me. She was silent for a long time before speaking again. What will I do now? Is that a real question? Or do you genuinely want my answer? I didn't wait for her to reply before proceeding. There are a few things you could do. You may relocate far away and start over. That's what I'd propose. I'm not letting my children spend time with you so it won't affect them if you leave or you may stay here. Try to retain your dignity in town. But who knows who will hear about what you've done or who might hire someone like you. Maybe you'll find someone desperate enough not to care about your background. But what type of person would it be? Or you may end it all. I truly hope you don't select that. It would deprive me of the chance to see you suffer. But then I doubt my opinion counts to someone like you. It surely didn't when you started sleeping with your employer. I had fantasized giving that speech for months. I should have felt pleased about finally stating it. As I watched each syllable break her down, I thought I'd feel some relief. But I just felt empty. Life after divorce was a combination of good and bad. Surprisingly, I fared much better with my cases than I ever expected, winning well over $1 million from settlements with the three companies whose employees had affairs with my wife. My lawyer had cautioned me not to expect much, but after witnessing how we handled my ex-wife's company, they wanted to avoid the bad headlines. We had crippled my ex-wife's company with legal demands, witness interviews, and by leaking details to the media, I also launched a secret campaign emailing the CEOs of their remaining clients about my wife, her boss, and their affairs, asking if they really wanted to be associated with that company when everything fell apart. Gradually, their business suffered. Revenues plummeted and staff who wished to avoid the scandal quit. Eventually, they went bankrupt. Alan Henderson was sacked and left town in shame. Receiving a $200,000 payout from the case was smaller than my prior triumphs, but felt more rewarding. I didn't win anything from my lawsuits for alienation of affection, but I hadn't really expected to. However, four spouses ended up losing a lot in their own divorces because of it. But it wasn't all celebrations and victory. The process also damaged me. People familiar with my tale would sometimes mock or tease me, which got very severe for a while. I'm not sure if it was good or terrible, but I didn't really care much about their comments. I already felt defeated, so their remarks didn't make much of a difference. Some of their insults were even fairly witty. I managed to protect my children from much of the damage. Keeping kids safe was always my primary focus. They were first sad, but recovered fast. My greatest success was returning to seats as the Vice President of Design and Development. During my trying times, I worked on programming and produced an add-on for primary software that allowed it to interact easily with too popular software from competitors. I formed my own company to sell my design within a year. All three businesses made bids to buy my company and software. I sold my company for $11 million and received an outstanding compensation package from CTS. I pondered about retiring, but... Without a social life, I worried I'd become a hermit if I didn't have reasons to get out of the house daily. My new financial condition permitted me to engage a sweet, elderly woman as a part-time maid and nanny for the kids. After a year, Mrs. Marlene Jensen moved in with us full-time, living in the suite over the garage in our new home. She was like a grandma to my children, usually soft and loving, but strong when required. I respected the guidance she offered them. Wisdom that only comes with experience. I loved my children and tried everything I could to be a helpful and caring father. But I was also scarred and cynical. Mrs. Jensen also became someone I could turn to for help, especially when making decisions. My children grew up to be well-adjusted people, and though we saw each other sometimes over time, we got less connected. I never blamed them. It was better. They kept their distance. So my bitterness wouldn't affect their lives. Mrs., Jensen stayed with us until the kids left to college. Then she retired. I offered her free lodging and board as a pension. She had been a regular presence in my life for 15 years. She always urged me to start living again and to find someone to spend my life with. I admired her efforts, but finally she went away knowing I would always be alone. 
I never really opened out to anyone again. My friendships were superficial and unsatisfying. I hardly ever dated save for a few group dinners hosted by acquaintances. I gained a reputation as a cold, cruel person who wasn't to be messed with. Mostly people stayed away from me, and I blamed solely myself for physical intimacy. I managed well enough. My expanding income allowed me to keep a steady group of call girls and escorts. I paid them nicely for their time and company. Essentially, I used them and then sent them on their way. There was one candy whom I admired for a time, though I later realized her real name was Mary Beth. She was energetic and engaged. I felt she cared about me more than simply as a client, yet I couldn't burden her with my concerns. So once I realized she was getting too near, I ended it. If you're curious about Jennifer, life was terrible for her. She attempted for about a year to talk to me, though I'm not sure why. Perhaps she hoped for reconciliation or a relationship with my children. I had warned her, but she didn't listen. She tried to stay in Chicago, so I had her followed. Whenever she applied for a job, I made sure her employers understood her past. When she started dating again, which was nearly immediately, I emailed her dates information about her background to ensure they knew precisely who they were dealing with. I didn't care whether they stayed with her, but I didn't want her rewriting her history. I had to live with it every day, so she should too. As for my ex-wife... She kept trying to contact me with endless unanswered calls, letters I never read or replied to, and constantly overflowing my email inbox. Part of me undoubtedly wanted to know she was suffering. Perhaps I should have sought expert treatment early on. It might have preserved some part of me and brought some normalcy back into my life, but I never did. And as time went on, it felt too late to help. I might have changed my phone number or had an assistant handle my mail or even banned her emails to avoid opening one by accident. But I never took those measures. It was simply a bunch of, I'm so sorry. And it didn't mean anything. Obviously, things had gotten out of hand. She swears she always loved me. Hadn't she suffered enough? In response, I sent a gift with a short note. I got the most provocative underwear I could find from her favorite store wrapped it with a perfect white ribbon that emphasized the pink of the box. I included a wonderfully handwritten message. I'm sure she recognized the irony as she opened the card labeled, which I hope my message was clear when she saw the enormous A-plug and bottle packed with her new slat outfit. I thought the go-screw-yourself was easy enough. One of her would-be lovers tried to confront me about how I was treating my ex-wife. He arrived to my door inebriated, shoving me over as I opened it. It was a mistake on his behalf. As I've indicated, I'm just an average man with no fighting training. I've never been a violent person or even been in a fight. But I did have a lot of pent-up hatred against my wife and her lovers. He tragically became the outlet for that wrath. I ended up with a black eye and a shattered rib, and he was lucky to come out alive. He pleaded guilty to minor charge and unlawful entrance and earned probation as a first-time offender. I think his years of surgery and recuperation made a lasting influence. Jennifer never tried to reach out to me again. I stopped tracking her after another year when she landed a solid job cleaning at a motel in a distant section of Virginia some 700 miles away from me. The only other time I saw her was six years later at our daughter's wedding. I know the kids reconnected with her a couple years after they graduated college. I never tried to stop them from locating her. The years had taken their toll on her. She had gained at least pound twenty and deep creases had appeared around her lips, exhibiting evidence of smoking, which was new. Overall, she appeared elderly and worn. Yet underlying all that, I could still see the lady to whom I had once given my heart. I felt nothing for her, yet I recognized her. She sat by herself in the rear of the bride area of the church. Her encounters with my daughter were short, courteous, and remote. She didn't try to speak to me at all. We stayed approximately 30 feet apart till the end of the evening when I noticed her waiting outside for a cab. I observed a small gold band with a tiny diamond on her left ring finger and smiled for the first time in a long. It seems she might have fared better than me after all. I approached her, fascinated on the ring for a few moments, glancing up to meet her gaze. I observed great sadness in them. For the record... You damaged my life first. I glanced at her left hand and back into her gaze. I am delighted you found someone. I hope he makes you happy. I hurried to my car where my driver was waiting. Good evening, Mr. Smith. I hope you had a pleasant evening, sir. 
Are we off to the club? It went as well as I could have hoped for, Jonathan. Let's head right back to the house. I guess I would like to be alone tonight. Certainly, sir. As we drove off, I tried not to look back, yet I did saw her quick wave goodbye. Here's my side of the tale. I believed myself cute, as did my friends and family. I had always been a bit self-conscious about my appearance and figure, especially compared to some of my lovely sorority sisters. But seeing myself through Michael's eyes made me feel special. The longer I was with him, the more cherished I felt. One of the sororities and of year traditions was the husband prospect game as one of the few sisters without a long-term lover. I'd never participated before. It was a popular event in which each sister provided either a favorable or negative example of another sister's lover from the previous year. The sister with the most complimentary comments about her lover. One, I wasn't completely surprised by the conclusion, but it caught me off guard. For the first time in the event's 29-year history, Michael received only positive reactions, one from each sister. I felt quite proud. I was a little disappointed that tradition prohibited me from telling him about his triumph the day after graduation. We arrived to my childhood home just before lunch, and Michael spent the next two hours charming my parents, including asking my father if he might buy him a beer. Later he said that he had asked my father for permission to marry me. During my undergraduate years, being an innocent always made me feel humiliated. I believe I was the only sorority sister who hadn't experienced closeness yet. I knew Michael was inexperienced, just like me. Following the incredible experience, I couldn't help but wonder where he learned to be such a wonderful lover. In his humble way, he said, I read a lot. I can't find the perfect words to describe how happy I was during our first decade together. Having children completes my existence. But those nuances are irrelevant to what went wrong. Sharing those pleasant years would not help you understand why I made the decisions I did. I acknowledge my faults, or rather, errors. I understand why I fell. I didn't trust Michael enough. Michael's candor was something I admired the most. He revealed everything, including his vulnerabilities. He never hid from me. For a long time, I had nothing to hide. He involved me in all decisions that affected our lives. Even though he made more money and was more financially savvy, he always valued my advice. It made me feel special most of the time, but I also felt inadequate, as if I wasn't doing my part. I never told Michael about this. If I had, I would not have destroyed my life. He would have backed me. I know he cared passionately for me. He would have made me feel more complete. That small feeling of insecurity grew over time. It could have gotten even worse by the time our children were in school. I didn't feel like I belonged in my own life. I felt like I needed something different. Something that would give me my own sense of purpose. I was not looking for another partner. Not at all. I loved my husband and was perfectly content with our bed life. It was passionate, if perhaps a bit predictable. Mostly due to me. I knew my husband wanted to try new things in the bedroom, but I didn't want to change anything we had. What I really wanted was to feel like I was on equal footing, rather than simply being treated as such. So I found a job and decided to accept it. I had everything planned out and was ready to explain why I wanted to work, but our conversation did not last long. I think that's fantastic, Jennifer. Do whatever makes you happy. And with that, my problem was solved. I had done everything on my own. I didn't need anybody's help. Looking back, I realized how foolish I was to believe I had everything figured out, but at the time it felt incredible. As a self-assured and independent woman, I felt like I could take on the world. The atmosphere in our office was frequently flirtatious, and at worst, it could be described as debauched. My co-workers, both men and women, were young, fearless, and full of energy. Several office romances occurred. Nobody was in a committed relationship. It was all about casual behavior, and no one seemed to hide it or think it was wrong. My boss was probably the worst. Alan Henderson was decent-looking, but not really my type. People often teased him about his inability to maintain a girlfriend while cheering him on with his latest conquests. I did not rush into bed with the first guy who expressed interest in me. In fact, I turned him down outright. However, it made me wonder if Michael and I were missing something in our bedtime routine. Our circle of friends was fairly conservative in terms of closeness. We never had conversations that came close to what I heard at work every day. Things changed after I introduced Alan to Michael at our company's first Christmas party. 
They pretended to get along, but I could tell they didn't like each other. I stopped speaking with Michael about my job and never mentioned Alan. I could tell it bothered Michael that night. Things felt different at work, too. Alan began paying close attention to me, publicly congratulating me on my work and inquiring about my health. He started inviting me to lunch with him, and we talked a lot about work. He began to seek my opinion more frequently. Then he'd ask personal questions before we went back to work. He also began complimenting my appearance, using terms such as hot and provocative. Looking back, he manipulated me for months, and I foolishly fell for it. I don't remember the exact sequence of events that led to Alan and his closeness with me on his desk after everyone else had left for the day. I regret to admit that I enjoyed every minute of it. Alan's expert seduction made me feel desired, which I thought I had lost. Years later, as I reflected on my actions, I realized the gravity of my betrayal. Michael didn't make me feel desired because I didn't give him a reason to. I knew what type of man he was. He would not do anything to make me uncomfortable. I was his true partner and beloved lover, not just a fling, but he was perceptive. Any hint would have helped me. Any indication that I desired something different would have contained a signifier. Huge impact. A painful review of my marriage revealed that Michael gently probed for any opportunity to spice up our bed life, which I ignored. We participated in BJ, but I never initiated it. I wore lingerie, but I never made an effort to be more adventurous, and I never allowed him to explore certain aspects of our intimacy. Not even once. I'm ashamed to admit that I did all of those things and more for Alan. I was for him, and I enjoyed it. I was way too involved with Alan before I realized the truth. I had given Alan the gift of my innocence for his birthday. He treated me the way I deserved. I gave him a gift, which he used. It was painful. The contrast with Michael was startling, and it changed my perspective almost immediately. Alan did not love me, and I was making a huge mistake. I told Alan that our affair would end the next day. He laughed and shooed me out of the office. When I returned from lunch, a package was waiting on my desk. It came with a note instructing me to meet in Alan's office at 530. The package contained photos of Alan and me in compromising positions. These images kept me under his control, trapping me in a nightmare that lasted over a year and a half. Being coerced into sleeping with my two co-workers in Alan's office felt almost tolerable in comparison to everything else I had to go through during those 18 months. I'm not going to go into detail, but I felt like Alan was using me as a prop, and I despised him almost as much as I despised myself. I tried to find a way out of the situation, but always came up short. It wasn't until I reached my limit with the horrible things I was forced to do that I saw a way out. When they demanded that I be intimate with a guy in a crowded conference room, I knew I couldn't take it any longer. It was a terrifying experience, and it was the last straw. I finally found my solution after a long search. I confronted Alan and told him I was finished. He laughed regardless of who he showed the pictures to. That was the end of it. I felt like a fool for allowing it to go on so long. When I awoke from my nightmare, I was surprised by what was going on at home, Michael and the kids appeared to be managing without me. I assumed they would be struggling without my attention, but it was the opposite. They didn't seem to need me at all. Michael was still doing. He had a new car, new clothes, and appeared successful. I felt terrible when I realized how long I had neglected my family. I decided to devote myself to them and make amends for my mistakes. However, there was a distance between us that had not previously existed. I wondered how long it had been there. Michael never yelled or argued with me, but he treated me as if I wasn't wanted. I attempted to reconnect with him, but nothing worked. He barely touched me. After a few months, I contemplated our marriage. No intimacy, no communication. I could not live like that. I recommended marriage counseling. But then Michael stopped speaking to me altogether. Not a word for it. I was at my wit's end when my birthday arrived. I hoped he would not ignore me on my birthday, but I was mistaken. When I arrived home from work, the house was empty, except for one wrapped box on the dining table. I knew what it was before opening it. Years ago, I forgot Michael's birthday and bought him a cheap watch as a last-minute present. I intended to make it up to him, but I never did. In contrast to mine, his present was intentional. I was angry when I went to bed. Keeping the kids away on my birthday seemed cruel. I couldn't believe he did that. And the present has crossed a line. I should have known something was wrong. Michael was not evil.
He was kind and loving. If I hadn't been blinded by anger, I might have saved our marriage by admitting my mistakes and seeking forgiveness. But at that point, I gave up trying to save our marriage and began considering divorce. It was sad, but I remained determined. It took several weeks to work things out with a lawyer. I told her how distant and cruel Michael had been, how he kept the kids for me, ignored my requests for counseling, and stopped communicating with me. My lawyer identified an opportunity and assured me of a favorable settlement. We have filed for divorce. I tried to be fair while also fighting for the things I needed to live a decent life. All that remained was to tell Michael. I stood in the doorway watching the man who had once been my husband. He appeared the same, but he wasn't. Finally, I could not take it anymore. Michael, I want a divorce. There was a long pause, but he did not show any emotion. I thought I saw him smiling, but he was probably shocked. His response surprised me. No yelling or questions? Okay. The following Friday, he received the divorce papers. Michael appeared nicer over the weekend, but if he was attempting to repair things, it was too late. I was not interested in making up. He even said goodbye when I left for work on Monday. Too little, too late. I thought there was chaos when I arrived at the office, but I wasn't sure why. My boss, the company president, and our lawyer were all yelling in the conference room. Papers flew everywhere. I was completely focused on that scene. I didn't realize the man was waiting for me. Are you Jen Smith? Yeah, you have been served. They handed me a large envelope, took my picture, and left. I didn't even have time to sit down with a security guard or an HR representative. The manager approached me. Mrs. Smith, you are suspended while we investigate allegations of misconduct. Please gather your belongings and leave, she said. It was embarrassing to pack up while everyone was watching, and being escorted out was even worse. I had no idea what was happening. As I exited the parking lot, my lawyer called. She was furious, accusing me of concealing information and making her look bad. I drove home in silence. Once inside, the house felt empty again. It hit me hard when I finally calmed down enough to look at the envelope. Michael's response to my divorce petition was brutal. He documented every affair I had and our savings were depleted. The term adultery cut deep. Calling my parents for help only made matters worse. My father called me names and hung up. I understood why the next seven days felt like the loneliest of my life. However, looking back, they were almost peaceful. Michael had taken the children camping and left a note. My friend Rebecca called to warn me about a DVD Michael sent her. As my lawyer explained my dire situation, it sank in. I got fired. My company and clients have been sued, and I lose custody of my children. It felt hopeless. I will do anything to stop the lawsuits. I tried to calm myself down before Michael and the kids returned, but I couldn't stop crying. When they returned, it was as if I had disappeared. Michael, relaxing with a beer, barely acknowledged me. I could barely speak. You are ruining me. I succeeded. I hope so. When I mentioned our past marriage, he spat venom. He hurled insults at me despite the fact that I wasn't speaking to him directly. Michael launched a vicious verbal attack on me, using names that cut deep. I made every effort to reconnect with Michael, but he completely ignored me. I was concerned about how he and the kids were doing financially, but everything seemed fine. I'd secretly watch him drop off or pick up the kids from school, unable to find work and shunned by my parents. I went from friend to friend, mostly divorced men. None of them wanted me around for very long. My lawyer recommended that I see a therapist, which gave me some hope, but I was not optimistic. During therapy, I worked through some issues, many of which I've discussed with you. The therapist's most important advice came later, to leave or get away. I'm not sure why he decided to respond to me, whether it was a phone call, an email, or one of the numerous letters I sent. But when I returned home, I found a package from Michael. A clear message of disdain suggesting how I should spend my time. I couldn't understand why knowing that he was aware of my betrayal affected me so deeply, but it did. I cried a lot. At the time I was staying with a man named Robert, a friend of a friend. He seemed nice, but I got the impression he wanted more than just roommates. When he saw the package and realized what it meant, he became very angry and stormed out before I could stop him. I became concerned when Robert did not return within a few hours. It turns out he went to confront Michael. The hospital staff did not provide many details, but they did say Michael had nearly killed him. Robert suffered severe injuries, including a shattered leg, concussion, internal injuries, and a messed up face. 
It was terrible. My problems were causing harm to those around me. I told my therapist everything in our next session. She asked many questions about Michael. I revealed everything I knew about him, including his background, relationship, and actions. After learning about my affair, I told her what happened to Robert. After hearing everything, she appeared scared. You need to leave. Far away. Do not contact him. Don't tell him where you are. There's no way to fix things. Move on. If you push, he may destroy you. Your actions shattered a man who was barely hanging on. He's been disappointed all his life. He will not forgive or forget. Run. So I left behind the memories of my once perfect life and ended up in a crappy college town in Virginia where I got an even worse job. Years later, I met a guy who could put up with me and ignore my past. He wasn't perfect, but at least he didn't stink or hit me. Our relationship lacked love. It was simply about having someone around. I assumed it was part of my punishment. When my children grew up, they contacted me just to check in and let me know they were fine. They never asked to see me or established a genuine connection. Michael, on the other hand, thrived even without me. I kept track of him through the news. He was always a big shot in the software industry, raking in money. Little was said about his personal life. I saw him again at our daughter's wedding. I was surprised to receive the invitation. He looked incredible, exactly like the man I once loved and betrayed. I admit I was a little scared when he approached me to deliver his final jab. Just so you know. You ruined my life first, he said, looking at my cheap wedding ring. In that moment, I wished I hadn't worn it. I'm glad you found someone. I hope he brings you happiness, he added before disappearing. Here is the next story. That November day was bitterly cold, and Sam, who was fighting a nasty cold, felt utterly miserable working outside, which only added to his discomfort. He could have taken the easy way out, like many others, and called in sick, but that wasn't his style. He was a dedicated member of his family's business and always gave his all. Sam had a personal mantra. If something was worth doing, it was worth giving your all. He rarely called in sick unless he was truly incapacitated, which had only happened twice before when he had to be hospitalized. But on this particular day, at ten o'clock, his body had reached its limit. Arturo, the foreman, insisted he go home, citing the risk of infecting the entire team. So Sam sat in his truck outside his house, perplexed to see his brother's truck in the driveway when Jimmy should have been at work. This was unusual because Jimmy had no legitimate reason to be there without Sam present. Furthermore, Sam was only covering for Jimmy because Jimmy was allegedly meeting with a potential client in a nearby town. Entering the house, Sam followed the sounds to his bedroom, where he overheard his brother and wife engaging in activities he didn't want to witness. Sam, driven by rage and betrayal, decided to confront them while recording the scene on his phone. His rage boiled over as he vowed to confront Jimmy about his deception. Sam stormed into the room. He launched a kick at Jimmy, catching him off guard and inflicting severe pain. However, Sam quickly realized the consequences of his actions and restrained himself from further retaliation, knowing that it would land him in trouble. Meanwhile, Jimmy, realizing he had no chance against his enraged brother, was overcome with fear. Sam reflected on past events, recalling how Jimmy, his older brother, used to have the upper hand. But as Jimmy transitioned to a more desk-bound role, Sam thrived in the outdoor work, gaining power and influence within the organization. Meanwhile, Jimmy lost ground. Jimmy used to tease Sam about his age, claiming that as the older sibling, he would always have the upper hand. But that day, Sam decided to question his older brother's authority in front of Jimmy's wife. They decided to settle it through an arm wrestling match. Jimmy is amused by Sam's defiance. Allow his cockiness to get the best of him. It's time to remind my younger brother who's boss. Jimmy smirked at his wife while they sat at the table. Shoot, Jimmy muttered as he struggled to move Sam's arm. Despite his efforts, Sam remained unmoved, flashing a smug smile. Jimmy could tell Sam was not even trying his hardest. Looking into Sam's eyes, Jimmy recognized he was in for a public humiliation. Facing all of the pent-up animosity and maltreatment he'd inflicted on his younger brother over the years, he could see Sam relishing the opportunity for restitution. To add insult to injury, Sam even played with Jimmy, lowering his hand halfway and checking his watch before casually returning it to the table. 
Jimmy felt completely humiliated when Sam casually yawned and effortlessly pinned his hand down. Jimmy vowed vengeance after that. In truth, Jimmy got what he deserved. He had bullied Sam all his life, and such mistreatment could not go unpunished. Jimmy's marriage ended before the following Thanksgiving, when his infidelity was discovered by a private investigator hired by his wife. Six months later, Sam and Camilla tied the knot. Growing up in a home where my father, Jacob, established a construction company when I was three, life was mainly happy with just family members having ownership. My mother, Evelyn, began as an accountant. I have an older brother, Jimmy, as previously said, and a younger sister, Stephanie or Steph. For the most part, we were a loving family, but Jimmy used to torment me, and Steph, as the youngest and a girl, received preference from our parents, which I despised. Despite my parents' love for me, I often felt overshadowed by my brothers. Jimmy was groomed to take over the firm, and Steph was the golden kid. My brother made sure I never forgot my role as the middle kid, and my parents unintentionally favored Steph, making me feel like an afterthought. They didn't notice the imbalance when they expected me to drive Steph about after I earned my driver's license. Despite the fact that I did not receive the same treatment as Jimmy, I want to be clear that I am not complaining or seeking pity. These are only the facts. I recognized my role in the family dynamic and I wasn't furious with my parents yet. It was simply how things were. Everyone had a role, and I was the middle child. I gradually accepted this. It was obvious that my older brother would eventually inherit the firm, while my younger sister would be cared for. I knew I had to forge my own path, so there I was, married for over a year and a half, discovering my older brother was divorced and cheating, having an affair with my wife in our house and bed. I won't get into the details. Jimmy fled, swiftly dressed, followed by Camille, who packed her belongings and went in 20 minutes. Because the house was mine before we married and we had a prenuptial agreement, it was not deemed marital property. So I instructed my lawyer to handle the divorce process, signed my terms, and left town. The ultimate divorce decree came six months later. It appeared that everything went smoothly, yet this was far from the case. In actuality, I didn't travel far. After leaving the city, I went to confront my parents and presented them with evidence of Jimmy's infidelity. Their answer was condescending, telling me to get over it. They underlined Jimmy's future role in the company and encouraged me to pursue family unity. Even my sister agreed with them. Consider Jimmy's actions to be a mere blip on the route to greater good. If I pushed back, I would be the one shunned. They insisted that I let go and be happy for Jimmy and Camilla. To make matters worse, Camilla moved in with Jimmy that same night, and I was advised not to cause any problems. Jimmy was clearly the preferred one, and I felt completely alone in my struggle. I promised not to return until I got my retribution. My parents made it very obvious. Jimmy was the heir apparent, and I needed to accept this without generating further controversy. Even my sister, despite her engagement with Jimmy, encouraged me to move on and concentrate on work. When I finally confronted Camille... Things got worse. It all began about a month after our wedding when she admitted to a romance with Jimmy. She shockingly revealed how many times I covered for Jimmy. It was so that he could be with her. She also revealed that she was pregnant. The baby was Jimmy's. I felt like the innocent victim in this situation, but to my disappointment, my entire family supported the culprits. I watched as they embraced Jimmy and Camille, ignoring my presence. They lavished them with compliments and congrats, deleting all mention of my relationship with my wife. Throughout my divorce, my family hardly acknowledged my distress, discussing it only in passing as it connected to Jimmy and Camille's wedding. Timing. Despite superficial invitations to family functions, it was clear that I was just there as a formality as long as I met my professional duties. That seems to be all they cared about. The final straw occurred during a quick Thanksgiving meal interaction of three minutes and thirty seconds when I was met with animosity before being shown the door. In that moment, I pledged two things. I would cut all links with them and one day return to get my retribution for their betrayal. They were supposed to be my family, loving and supporting me, yet they abandoned me when I needed them the most. I resolved to return and dismantle their world just as they had mine. Two weeks later, Jacob's frustration bubbled over as he demanded to know Samuel's location. Evelyn, concerned, joined the fray, perplexed by Samuel's absence. 
Stephanie stepped in, clarifying that the Geralds in the project were Jimmy's responsibility, not Samuel's. Furthermore, Samuel had been unavailable for weeks, ignoring his responsibilities despite knowing he needed to cover for Jimmy. Jacob was outraged and ordered Stephanie to find down Samuel right away for a strong reprimand. Stephanie, feeling overwhelmed by the situation, made several attempts to contact Samuel, including a visit to his home, only to return with unsettling news for her father and the rest of the family. Where the hell is Samuel? I expressly told you he should have arrived first thing this morning, Jacob demanded. Is frustration visible? But I didn't see him, Jacob's wife said, throwing an anxious look around the room at their eldest son, Camille, and daughter. Jacob frowned and scanned the room. He left and his wife stammered. Left? What do you mean by left? Jacob's mother intervened. I meant left. I'm not sure where he's gone. He isn't responding to SMS or calls. I even went to his house yesterday and saw it was being prepped for new residents. It appears he has rented it out, she stated. Are you attempting to say he abandoned his family? Jacob virtually yelled. Stephanie had a rough night following these findings. Unable to sleep, she remembered several instances and statements from the previous few years. Sleep became even more elusive as she recognized the unavoidable reality. She vividly remembered how everyone handled her brother. No, she replied softly. I believe he understands his family abandoned him. After leaving home, I joined the Army Corps of Engineers. While in college, I worked part-time for a company until I finished my degree in civil engineering, which was followed by an MBA. The original intention was for Jimmy to head the family business, with me on the executive team. However, my plans modified over time. Today, a key milestone in my new strategy was scheduled to occur, witnessing my younger sister enter a nearby building. I couldn't help but smile, even though it was obvious she didn't remember me. The last decade has brought about considerable changes in me. I spent some of my free time reflecting over the past few years. Joining the Army was a crucial decision. My degree and history were assets, resulting in a warm greeting. Deployed to the desert, I spent my free time undergoing intensive training in weaponry and hand-to-hand -hand fighting. After six months of duty, I was promoted to captain. During a mission, we were considering re-enlistment when our convoy was hit by an improvised explosive device. Despite my injuries, I rushed into action, assisting a wounded parliamentarian under gunfire, following the initial medical aid. Even though I was injured, I defended our position until aid arrived. Eventually, tiredness took over and I blacked out as rescue helicopters neared. My eyes widened at the sight of green pools, framed by the face of an angel with glowing red hair. I must be in heaven, I mused. The angel's brows furrowed briefly before her face brightened up. What makes you believe that? She questioned in a lovely musical tone. I was very convinced I'd make it through, but it turns out I died. Why do you believe you've died? I mean, I've never died before, so I don't know for sure. But waking up to an angel does feel like a clear sign, I responded. Her features brightened into a happy grin as laughter bubbled from her. Sorry to bust your bubble, but I am not an angel. I'm actually a lawyer, she admitted. I couldn't help smiling. So I'm just in a different location. But as long as I can keep seeing you here, I'm fine with it. If it were up to me, you'd see me frequently. Fortunately, it will not be in hell. You, brave soldier hero, are still very much alive, she reassured me. You are currently in a hospital in Germany. You were treated on the base and then moved here, she explained. Since you indicated that you are a lawyer, not a nurse, I am intrigued about who you are and why you are here with me. Not that I'm complaining, but I doubt suing the rebels for pain and suffering will succeed, I quipped. Her laughter echoed again. I enjoy your sense of humor. No, I am not here to sue anyone. I am Rebecca Caulfield. My sister June was the MP you saved from the Hummer and cared for. Everyone says she wouldn't have made it without you. How's she doing? Will she be okay? I inquired eagerly. She will be all right. Her leg was saved, but she will have a minor limp. Rebecca reassured me. And this is how I met Rebecca and her sister. Rebecca kept her word and divided her time between me and her sister during my recovery in Germany. After electing not to return to the army, I was discharged with honors. Rebecca and I became closer after returning to the United States, and we eventually began to date. I told her about my background, including how my ex-wife and family had betrayed me, as well as my revenge plot. Essentially, 
I want to create my own construction company and compete with my family's business, leveraging my intimate knowledge to undercut them. Rebecca, after some thinking, suggested a more direct approach. I'm going to burn them. She outlined her strategy, and I couldn't help but be impressed. Rebecca's parents turned out to be quite affluent and adored me, while I harbored enormous resentment for my own family's behavior. Unfortunately, Rebecca's older brother exhibited tremendous financial acumen and leveraged our combined assets. We formed a new LLC. Rebecca's father, who was nearing retirement, took over as president of the company, while her brother served as acting CFO and Rebecca as CEO, ensuring that my name remained off the records. Despite my extensive engagement in operations, our first move was to acquire a faltering construction firm. With my guidance, we quickly turned things around. Within six months, we absorbed another company, and by the end, we had purchased five additional businesses around the country. Throughout this, Rebecca and I became closer, eventually developing a love relationship. Now, sitting across from my family's business, I awaited the opportunity to inflict my revenge. I have earned significant fortune over the years as a result of my investments and the success of our business. Furthermore, Rebecca and I recently became engaged, which fueled my eagerness. Smirking, I awaited the approaching demise of my erstwhile family. Unbeknownst to them, several individuals had been quietly purchasing publicly traded stocks, resulting in a plot to unfold. Steph's mood was particularly unpleasant, which has been common lately. She was well aware that the majority of the company's employees disliked them. As CFO and daughter of the board chairman, she exercised significant power. However, if the situation required it, her older brother, the CEO, would step in. Anyone who crossed her path would quickly find themselves out of work because it was a family-run business. However, her current worry stems from an unscheduled board meeting, which is unusual given their quarterly timetable. Typically, she made decisions with her parents, brother, and herself. Board meetings are essentially formality, with the family collectively owning 60% of the shares and each member holding a 12% stake. Their domination was unquestionable. A brief explanation was in order. Several years ago, the family, excluding Sam, who left without a trace, decided on a significant expansion, going public to raise finance. Despite no formal arrangement with Sam, his shares were voted on alongside the families. Given his extended absence, Steph paused before the office door and observed a slightly familiar man across the street, who vanished as a bus passed by, shrugging off the distraction. She entered the building expecting the meeting to be mundane. Despite the recent convening and next session not due for another two months, the agenda followed its normal pattern with briefings from various divisions recounted leaving Steph unimpressed. There has been no change since last month. Any new business, however, will be handled, declared the striking brunette. I noted a little limp in her movement, suggesting she might have sustained an injury. It was then Steph discovered the board meeting was abnormally scant. Absent were the traditional large shareholders, replaced by a few smaller ones, including the brunette petitioner and a newcomer blonde. I endorse this motion, exclaimed the blonde. Steph couldn't help but wonder what was occurring. Their assumption that they could pull off such a maneuver seemed absurd, with the family controlling 60% of the ballots. It appeared futile. Yet the two women pressed forward, unmoved by the astonishment of others. The argument was quick but vigorous, resulting with the anticipated vote tally, Mez. As expected, Caulfield announced yes with 35% of the vote. Since she recommended it, the blonde answered. Several more votes were cast against, totaling 1% of shares for 39% in support and 1% against the family holding. 60% of voters were yet to cast their ballot. Of course, Jimmy, myself, my mother, and father all voted against. After all, Dad served as chairman. Steph mentioned 49% against 39% in favor. Just as Jimmy attempted to strengthen our position as Sam's confidant, the door slid open, showing the tall man we'd seen earlier. Yes. Samuel Johnson, who received 12% of the vote, revealed my brother's absence for a decade. Our family business was abruptly taken away from us and given over to our estranged brother, whom we had abandoned in favor of our older sibling. The meeting deteriorated from then on out. 
Samuel took over as chairman, removing Jimmy and appointed the blonde as his substitute. I, too, was fired as CFO and replaced by a brunette, something none of us could have predicted. There was no severance pay in the absence of a contract, only a quick deadline. You have ten minutes to gather your items and leave the premises. Fortunately, our homes and vehicles were business assets, bringing some relief. Sam allowed us a week to leave. Except Jimmy and Camilla, who only had 24 hours. Mom, Dad, Jimmy, Camilla, and I sat stunned as Sam seized command of the meeting. Despite being deprived of our authority, we remained important stockholders, relying on the company's prosperity to survive while our personal accounts contained little. The company covered our expenses, allowing us to focus on the company's growth. Our intention was to reinvest profits for future retirement, ensuring comfort in our later years. Okay. Sam exerted himself and took control of the meeting. Do you have any further questions? Yes. As RJ Enterprises presented a buyout, a gorgeous brunette added, There's one more thing to address. I'm assuming you're familiar with these terms. In summary, they intend to buy all outstanding shares as long as they have at least 51% ownership. Johnson Construction Inc. will be dissolved upon completion, and all assets will be acquired by a huge U.S. corporation. What about our staff? I am concerned about the livelihoods of our loyal team members. Mr. Johnson chimed in. Non-managerial employees will continue to work as usual, with only the company name on their checks changed. Our clients will continue to interact with recognizable faces. Executives will be sacked or reassigned to similar responsibilities at RJ. The chairman, CEO, and CFO at RJ have been given similar positions and will retire from their current ones. What about stockholders who refuse to sell? Sam queried, his attention fixed on us. Dissenters may exist, the RJ spokesman confirmed. However, after we achieve 51%, the remaining shares' acquisition price will be significantly decreased due to our control. There will be no need for further shares. Once we have made our strategy known, the remaining shares' value will collapse, leaving holdouts with decreased investments. Excellent. Is the representative still present? Yes. She's waiting in the lobby, ready to begin the proceedings. Should I have security bring her in? Sam gave security instructions. Soon after, an immaculately dressed woman appeared, exuding confidence with her gorgeous looks and powerful attitude. I couldn't help but wonder why all of these lovely women seemed to be involved in acquiring our company. And what was Sam's part in all of this? His unexpected arrival today, after a decade of silence, stirred doubts. His support for excluding our family from the company Dad built was baffling. What really was his motivation? So, as previously said, we are asking $120 per share for the initial 51%. Any remaining shares will be priced at $2 each. It simply isn't worth more to us if we gain majority control. Darn, I missed the beginning of her statement. I wished I had paid more attention. The decrease from $120 per share to $2 per share was terrible. While I did not want to sell, rejecting would have been disastrous. Hastily. I stood forward and stated my intent to sell. It was better for me to get in line as soon as possible. As the redhead turned to face me, she smiled brightly. Certainly. We'd be glad to buy your shares. You're now fourth in line, so I'll extend our offer when I finish the first three transactions. My stomach twisted as I made an educated guess about the first three sellers. Being fourth place was nearly as horrible as being last. I watched Sam, then the blonde, and finally the brunette. They all agreed to sell their shares. She had already gotten her 51%. Our entire capital was invested in the business. We expected to sell and pay out in another five years, becoming multimillionaires. We'd be fortunate now to obtain mere prosperity. We all had to return home to begin packing up security, and they seized our office and car keys before allowing us to leave the premises. We made plans with security to return the next day and empty away our offices. The blonde declared that she would terminate our access to the company's servers, canceling our logins in minutes. It wasn't a significant issue because our laptops had already been confiscated. She also informed us that our personal laptops would be taken the next day. Furthermore, any attempt to delete or modify files would result in serious charges of business espionage, fraud, evidence tampering, and theft. Jimmy was alerted that his computer had been seized immediately following the vote to remove Dad from office. We already have a forensic accountant looking at the books, 
Sam added with a smile. The next evening, everyone gathered at their parents' house. Jimmy, Camilla, and their three children arrived in a van, packed with all they could find on short notice and with no other options. They would stay with Jacob Benevolent until they determined their weekly living arrangements. After unloading the truck, park it temporarily in the garage. Family members gathered at the table to plan for the future. Okay. Good. We need to decide how to react. We cannot just sit back and accept this. We must fight back and restore our rights, Jacob stated. Agreed, Evelyn answered. But what's our strategy? How should we combat this? Where do we begin? We will contact our attorneys and commence the legal process. But Dad, we don't have any lawyers. We hired the company's lawyers and we no longer have control over the company. We'll need to recruit outside lawyers. That comes with a cost. Now, I realize we all have some money, but this is going to be a lengthy court struggle, and right now, I need all the money I can get to get by until I can get another job and get back on my feet. Stephanie explained, Perhaps it's time I paid a visit to my little brother. Jimmy chuckled, flexing his knuckles. Camilla looked at her husband attentively, taking in the appearance of her tall, muscular, and self-assured ex-husband pacing about the boardroom. I strongly advise against that, she said. Your previous attempt did not go as planned. He appears to be much tougher and stronger today than he was previously. Jimmy began to respond, but then went silent. Stephanie listened intently, ready to criticize any ridiculous suggestion. She contemplated a previously unmentioned idea while brainstorming. It was the only thing with any prospect of success. It wouldn't solve everything, but it might alleviate their current dilemma. What if we went to talk to him? The sudden silence was apparent, as all eyes in the room turned to her as if she had sprouted a third eye. Perhaps if we addressed him, admitted our sins, and sought forgiveness, he would not be so harsh. He may never truly forgive us, but if we humble ourselves and admit our mistakes, perhaps he can alleviate our suffering enough that we can bear it without being entirely destroyed. Chaos broke out. Do you expect me to grovel in his presence? After abandoning his family, he comes back here after ten years betraying his own blood. Are you completely insane? I'll never be like that ungrateful brat, Jacob thundered. Really, sis, after how he treated us before fleeing, and after what he did today, all I could think about was finding a way to get him back where he belonged, Jimmy exclaimed. Camilla was disgusted at the prospect of begging her weak ex-husband, Jimmy, who is ten times stronger than Sam. There is no way I would demean myself or my spouse by begging that weakling, dear, her mother interjected in the soft tone of a worried parent. I understand your concern, but we must address this threat to our family's well-being. Now is the time to fight back, not to surrender. No, we are not going to negotiate with our new foe. We will find a way to respond and regain what is rightfully ours. She ended by completely disregarding Stephanie's idea. The talk returned to the topic of retribution methods. Stephanie stayed mute while the topic swirled around her. She'd already determined what she needed to do for herself. She needed to get off the train before it derail. She discovered too late the harm her ostensibly loving family had perpetrated on her older brother. But Sam had already left by then, and she had no opportunity to apologize for her words or deeds. She was a spoiled, selfish child back then. Her revelation arrived two weeks later than it should. June Caulfield looked up as the secretary escorted Stephanie Johnson into her office the next morning, noting Stephanie's attire. A smart, dark blue pencil skirt, matching jacket, powder-colored shirt, black stockings, and four-inch heels. Overall, the appearance was pleasant and conservative. Stephanie's golden hair was expertly groomed, and her makeup was delicately applied. Despite hearing reports of Stephanie's toughness, June found her quite attractive and gestured for Stephanie to take a seat. June arranged the surprise rendezvous. Miss Johnson, what brought you here? I must admit that your presence this morning has taken me by surprise. Yeah, I'm sure my presence here surprises many people. I attempted to speak with Samuel today, but was told he was not expected. They suggested you take a message to him. Possibly. However, this is determined by the nature of the message. As previous events have shown, he is not interested in participating with your family simply for the sake of it. I've heard several things about you and your family. To be clear, I don't respect either of you after the way you treated him. So I guess you two are close? Stephanie asked, 
eager to learn more about the new characters in this evolving drama. Perhaps if she could win over this woman and demonstrate genuine contrition for her previous acts, she might be able to persuade her brother to reconcile. Yes, we're close, but not as close as you may think. We are not in a romantic relationship. We're just great friends. I consider him more of a brother than anyone else. Could you tell me about how you met? I could, but frankly, I don't think it's necessary right now. Maybe another time? I'm currently very busy planning for a new company's takeover. What message do you have for Samuel? Stephanie needed to express her real contrition for past mistakes to the lovely woman. Please notify Sam that I require immediate communication with him. I'm aware of how I've behaved in the past and sincerely apologize. Unfortunately, I realized this around two weeks after it should have happened. He had already left by then, and others were trying to figure out how to deal with his behavior. I'm trying to distance myself from it. I simply want to apologize to him in person. Yes, I pray for his forgiveness, but I will not ask him to spare me from any penalties. I'm hoping he'll consider allowing me to have some sort of relationship with him. I want him to understand that I'm separating from the rest of the family because I acknowledge their wrongdoing and refuse to participate in it. I'm not going to ask for his trust. I just want to reconcile with the brother I wrongly abandoned. Stephanie started crying. June sighed as she looked at the crying woman, drawing on her previous experiences with former partners and fired colleagues to distinguish between genuine and false shows of sadness. Stephanie's emotions were genuine, and she could tell. Okay, good. Look, Sam is gone until Monday. I will forward your mail and see if I can set up a meeting for you. I appreciate it. Thank you. There is no problem. Hey, how about we have some drinks and dinner tonight? I don't know many people around here, so I'd like to talk to you more and get your thoughts on anything. Stephanie was astounded by the offer. She found June incredibly appealing and had a real interest in women. She kept this information hidden from her family and attended gatherings with numerous men to keep her image. Nonetheless, wherever she traveled, she sought connections with women. This visit also provided an opportunity to explore deeper into June's connection with her brother and potentially gain information about the blonde and redhead who had surprised her family. She did not want to use this information against them. Rather, she intended to make allies in her drive to repair her connection with Samuel. Tell me more about your expectations, June inquired again that evening at the pub where they had met. I pretty much lay everything out earlier. All I want is the opportunity to build a new and better relationship with Sam. I recognize that I made a mistake and am willing to accept the consequences. To be honest, I'd be grateful for any pardon he grants. But even if he doesn't, I want to show him that I've changed and am dedicated to being a better sister. How do I know you're not just using this to gather information about him? You honestly don't. You have no reason to believe me, just as Sam does not. But I really want to know what happened to him in the last decade. I realize how important he is to you, and I would like to learn more about you and the other women in his life. If they are important to him, they are important to me, too. You mentioned you are like a sister to him, so you are also like family to me. Maybe you can teach me how to be Sam's sister, which I have previously failed to do. This is such an intriguing notion. It sounds reasonable. So you're obviously a lovely woman, and you appear to be really close to Sam? Why aren't you dating? Steph queried, puzzled by something about the situation. June laughed. There are actually two causes for this. I'll share because there is nothing you can use against us. To begin, Sam is already involved in another relationship. They are, in fact, engaged. Second, how do I put this? Let's just say you're far more my type than Sam. Stephanie found this news perplexing. So how did the two of you meet? I'd like to know. We first met while serving in the army. He rescued me from a vehicle accident and saved my life. He was also injured, but not as badly. That's also where I got my leg hurt. My family was incredibly thankful, and after hearing his story, we kind of took him in. Wow, we were unaware that he had served in the army. He simply departed without speaking. We had not heard from him until yesterday. Yes, I know. He intended to do so. I get it. We did not treat him very nicely. So you mentioned that he is engaged. Yeah. They'll get married once he's finished here. Who is she? Could you tell me? Is it the blonde? She's actually engaged to my older brother. Sam proposed to my sister. I believe both of them fell in love at first sight. Sam wakes up in a German hospital. All I wanted was to be by his side. 
Becca rushed right in to care for him and nurse him back to health. She's really protective of him. You don't want to be on her bad side. She's a tough lawyer, and I've witnessed the consequences of her determination to defeat her opponent in court. She has the ability to tear you apart at trial. I've seen her do it multiple times. It appears that I really need to meet her and avoid getting in her way. You've already met her. And you've already gotten on her bad side, dear. Is it a redhead? Yeah. She despises every one of you. It is critical to win her over. They both felt hungry and headed to the restaurant next door. The discussion continued as both women learnt more about one another. June was cautious with her comments because she did not want to divulge any information regarding Sam's ambitions. Steph inquired about the enormous firm, but June declined to answer any further questions. The meal came to a close and the two women finished the last of their wine. Okay, June, you indicated that winning over your sister Rebecca is essential for any chance of dating Sam, Stephanie said, reflecting on this during the rest of their dinner. Yeah, she acts as his gatekeeper, June answered. Well, I've discovered a fail-safe solution for that. Go on. June smirked. So, how are you going to transform my fiery sister from the depths of hell into the loving sibling you claim to be? It's quite simple. I'll win you over first, then you'll win your sister over for me. June grinned, thinking it was an interesting thought. How do you intend to win me over? I think it'll be fairly simple. Essentially, my objective is to invite you over and keep you engaged throughout the night. Then you'll be ill the next day, so we can go all day and into the weekend. I'm convinced that by Monday morning, when you arrive at work, you'll be ready to tell your sister what a wonderful woman I am and how you'd like her to embrace your new girlfriend with open arms. I see. So what's stopping me from rejecting your approaches and questioning your sincerity in becoming my girlfriend? Actually, two things. First and foremost, you've indicated that I'm your type, and I believe you're truly interested in me. Second... I just revealed my most important secret to you. None of my family members or friends are aware of my choices. Nobody even suspects anything. This is me revealing myself and coming out of the closet for you. That should show how serious I am. And if you still have questions after this weekend, just look at how my parents and Jimmy disowned me when it happened. I've made it plain that I'm going to confront them. This will just exacerbate the situation and reveal my intentions. Oh my goodness, sis. What did happen to you? You don't look good, Rebecca exclaimed when June arrived at the office on Monday morning. Three excellent days resulted in a severe lack of sleep. June responded, If you think I look bad, you should meet my new girlfriend. Wow. Okay. So who is this new girlfriend? How did this happen so quickly, Rebecca asked. Let me get some caffeine first, and then we need to meet with you and Sam for a chat. How about 20 minutes in Sam's office? June proposed. Of course, go grab some coffee. You look as if you require it, Sam responded. So, John, what's this about the new girl? Sam inquired as June entered his office, looking unkempt. Well, I had an unexpected visitor on Thursday while you were gone, which turned into a fantastic supper and an entire weekend. I seem to have a surprising new pal. Okay, who exactly is it? Becca expressed concern. June let the tension build for a minute, her gaze shifting between her sister and her prospective brother-in-law. Stephanie Johnson is her last name. She saw their faces change from excitement to shock. Several minutes went by before one of them spoke. My sister Sam ultimately got by, sort of, but I had to do some research between when she left my office and when we met later that evening. She seemed to have had a change of heart shortly after you left. Actually, she's genuinely sorry for how she treated you earlier, of course, you don't just take her word for it, even if she spent the entire weekend with you, right? Obviously not. Just to clarify, my name is June, not stupid. June laughed as Sam and Rebecca rolled their eyes at his joke. I really dug into this. A few longtime employees remarked that she seemed depressed shortly after you left. She was plainly depressed and morose for a few months and even acknowledged missing you. Could her associates have been attempting to weave a tale to her advantage? Sam recalled something doubtful. Anyone remember Kate? She too mentioned it. Sam reflected on his experiences. Okay, but I doubt Steph feels that way, Becca interjected. Yes, it is correct. She is completely committed to that. You can trust me. She appeared to be well-versed about the intricacies of feminine attachment. 
It was one of the things that convinced me she was truly trying to heal things by coming out and reconnecting with you. She's basically cutting ties with the rest of the family, June confessed. Becca observed that it sounded self-serving. I believe she is simply looking out for herself and anticipating what may happen. It may sound selfish, but it is not always a bad idea. I recommend hiring her as an assistant so that I can keep an eye on her. It will also help you judge her genuineness. Worst case scenario, it reveals information about everyone else. Jane made the proposal, and why not? Sam consented. Obviously, we'll have tracking software on all of her devices to see if she does anything suspicious. Set up a meeting between the three of us this afternoon. If all goes well, your brother will install the software and offer her the job. Just make sure you use your brain upstairs rather than downstairs. Becca mocked them as they finished the day. Sam was taken aback by the hate his sister spews against their parents. Brother, and especially, Camilla. She described how she had to play nice for the past decade in order to remain in their good graces. When questioned about her sudden shift in sexual orientation, she also revealed considerable information about the family's business operations and plans to regain control. She spoke openly about her journey. Steph acknowledged that she was now totally out and proud and that she hoped it would end their relationship with their racist family permanently. I've been depressed for the past decade. I'm deeply sorry. I hadn't realized it sooner, but it was too late. Even if you reject me now, I am grateful for the opportunity to finally apologize for my previous behavior. Steph reached a conclusion. Okay, that is fair. I understand your apologies. They appear sincere, and I'm eager to give a relationship a chance. However, there is a trust issue. I don't trust you because of your previous acts toward me and familial relationships. You have every reason to deceive us because I've essentially taken everything from you. Nonetheless, my future appears to believe you deserve a shot. Just be aware that we will be keeping a tight eye on you, and any mistakes will result in harsh consequences. Sam warned not to mess things up. So what exactly is this? What about RJ Enterprise? Steph asked. I'd never heard of it. Our company is called RJ, which stands for Samuel, Rebecca, and June. So it didn't really matter what we paid for our own stock. Essentially, we'd be shifting money between our own pockets, Sam clarified. That was something you should have expected. Stephanie never truly left the nest, Becca observed. June moved in and let her partner to live with her, which improved their relationship. Stephanie, June's assistant, tried to strengthen their link, while Sam and Steph formed a stronger sibling-like relationship thanks to dating sisters. June's declaration of living with her girlfriend drew the attention of her family, who were taken aback by her partner's true identity. Jimmy and Camilla lost their home to Dave and his fiancée, leaving their children to suffer as innocent victims. Sam chose compassion over vengeance, giving Jimmy and Camilla a job rather than leaving them unemployed. Despite their initial reservations, they eventually agreed due to the approaching eviction. Sam, on the other hand, made certain that they did not receive attractive employment by lobbying the community against hiring his former family. Jacob and Evelyn's attempt to sue Sam failed when their lawyers left after facing a powerful opponent in court, leaving them defeated. Later, Jacob and his wife marched into the law office where two lawyers warned them of their perilous condition. Do you even know who their attorney is? I inquired with one of my partners. We certainly do. Jacob gave a response. She is the representative of the corporation that bought us out, and she appears to be our disinherited son's fiancée. Then you don't get it. The second partner responded by shaking his head. I'm Rebecca Caulfield. To be honest, your argument is weak and unlikely to succeed. We hope they can reach an agreement rather than go to court. However, when Rebecca is involved, the situation becomes personal. She isn't going to just win. She'll destroy you and everyone else involved. We are starving for work, but we do not want to be destroyed by the most cutthroat lawyer in the business. With little cash, the couple had to settle for a small one-bedroom apartment on Social Security. Evelyn worked as an unpaid nanny while Jacob lamented his circumstances in Missouri. They are estranged from their youngest child and rarely see their eldest because of work. In their later years, they became isolated. Mr. Johnson, may I come in? The store cashier inquired as she softly entered Sam's office. Yes, Camilla, what are you thinking about right now? He responded with a smile at his ex-wife, who is now his daughter-in-law. I was wondering if we could move Jimmy to a job closer to us. He's been working out of state for months.
so we only see each other every two weeks. Even then, he's too fatigued to spend time together. I apologize, Camilla, but all of the adjacent vacancies are already filled. When Jimmy moved, he just shifted the problem to someone else. It just wouldn't be fair, Sam clarified. Camilla began to cry. Please, Mr. Johnson, I know you are furious with us, but I am desperate. I haven't seen my husband in several months. I'm prepared to do anything. She begged me. She seemed excited to reconcile with her hubby. A voice appeared on the speakerphone. Maybe she's not being completely honest. Another person chimed in. I don't believe her based on what she has said about her family. A third was added. Sam held a conference call with his fiancée, prospective sister-in-law and sister. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Camilla, it appears that your honesty is being questioned. Can you be more precise about what you're willing to do? Sam inquired. To be honest, I don't want you to be any closer to me than necessary. If there was job available in Siberia, I would transfer him there. Why would I draw him closer? Sam went on to detail Jimmy's demanding workload and little compensation. Camilla, I'm not convinced this is my issue. If things do not work out between the two of you, you can look for another job. Sam responded, that is not an option. We tried, but we couldn't afford to relocate, and no one will hire us again after what occurred. Camilla begged for mercy, frustrated by their lack of repentance, realizing that persuasion would be ineffective. Camilla turned to her final resort. I'm willing to do anything, she offered, secretly hoping for closer ties with Sam, whom she found more satisfying than her husband. She had compromised for Jimmy's future prosperity, but now she wanted to reclaim Sam and get rid of his fiance, whom she detested. She was slightly concerned about her conversation with Sam and his companions, but hoped for a nice conclusion. Okay, Pika, let's hear it from the speaker. Sam, how about this? We discussed having a menage a trois with another woman. I may not reciprocate, but I'm curious to see if anything changes. Camilla was even more shocked when June mentioned using another lady as a plaything for the night. Sam consented to the plan, which thrilled June. Camilla went to work on Monday, hoping that Sam would stick to their agreement. She was relieved when Steph told her Jimmy would be gone for the weekend and start a new job in town the following week. Camilla was concerned that despite their bad relationship, they would back out of the agreement. You disgusting imbecile. You set me up, right? Camille shrieked as she walked into Sam's office on Thursday afternoon, clutching the divorce papers she'd just been served. Among them were several explicit images of Camille indulging in lovemaking actions with multiple ladies, as well as one male who meticulously blurred all save her own face. In these photographs, he is kicking me out of the flat and accusing me of being an unsuitable mother. To myself, I will continue to shout. Her diatribe lasted another ten minutes, attracting a large throng that included Rebecca, June, and Stephanie. Despite her outburst, Sam remained sat, his demeanor composed with a trace of amusement. He didn't say anything until Camille stopped talking and began sobbing. Becca, as our company's attorney, what legal recourse do we have in response to the serious charges made by one of our cashiers? Sam addressed Rebecca. Well, Mr. Johnson, based on the evidence I've seen, she has no proof implicating you, me, or anyone else at the firm in her promiscuous behavior. My professional view is that she has found herself in a precarious situation and is clutching at straws to save her image and financial standing. I urge she be fired for cause, citing the development of a hostile work environment. Our security cameras have captured enough evidence of her fraudulent charges to warrant this. Rebecca offered advice, understood, regardless of the grief she created by abandoning me for my brother. I had believed that by aiding them and supplying jobs when no one else would, we might be able to heal our family split. It appeared to work on Stephanie. Camille, I must let you go. Please reach out to Human Resources. They'll explain your rights and options. When you go, you will receive your final paycheck. Sam declared, but I have nowhere to go. Jimmy threw me out and obtained a restraining order against me. Without this work, I won't be able to afford to rent another house or stay in a hotel for the night. Camille lamented that moving across country was an option. Camille was concerned about her lack of references for decent work and how to account for the gap in her work history. She could only hope for a minimum wage job, which would be insufficient to support herself and unlikely to reunite her with her children. Her next option was to live on the streets, 
begging for spare change in order to survive, at least allowing her to see her children on occasion during supervised visits. Jacob and Evelyn spent their remaining years on the verge of poverty, driven by hatred and anger, isolating themselves from Sam and making no attempt to contact Camille. Jimmy remained in a low-wage job with few opportunities for advancement. Salmon. Rebecca raised a loving family that valued equality among their children. June and Stephanie found joy in marriage, as did Stephanie and Sam, who formed a close sibling bond. Stephanie had two children through artificial insemination, with June's older brother as the donor. Thank you for taking time to listen to today's story. If you liked this essay, please like it and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a story about your or another person's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Please be careful.